Hello, everyone. My name is Franziska Bonat. I'm the host for today. And with us is Edmund Miller. He is a PhD student at the University of Texas at Dallas. And he's going to talk today about the pipeline from NF Core uh, called Nascent. And uh, to you. Hey. Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Edmund. Um, let's get started. I can advance the slides. Okay, so a quick overview um, of what we're going to talk about today. So a quick background on nascent transcript identification, because I'm not sure if it's as common as some other assays, such as like ChIP-seq or RNA-seq, um, a brief history of the development of the pipeline, and then lastly, we're going to talk about the pipeline itself and give a brief overview of that. <clears throat> so quick background on a nascent transcript identification. The goal is to identify the changes in transcription of the RNA and what's going on at the cell at that specific point in time. Rather than say RNA-seq, which isolates all of the RNA in the cell at a steady state. So that would be like your mRNA and things that have matured versus what's actually being transcribed. And, and so you can get an actual response to things like heat shock or viral infection. Um, and so pulling out the transcription activity sites through metabolic labeling of these, and we won't go into that too much today, um, but I'm happy to discuss that with anyone in the future. Um, and so the problem with that is that we're covering a lot of different assays, not just one or maybe some slight variations with that. We're covering lots of different chemistries, lots of different steps, et cetera. And because of that, um, some slight variation in computational and the computational pipeline can actually lead to 25% um, change in the results of the transcript calling. And we'll kind of talk about why that is later. Um, and so specifically what I'm interested in um, are enhancers. And so there's a lot of different things that you can call with uh, nascent transcripts, such as uh, miRNAs and long non-coding RNAs, and you can call the, the gene sequences as well. Um, but specifically what you can pick up that you really can't pick up in RNA-seq is enhancers. And so I'm in, so these are cis-acting DNA sequences that can then increase the transcription of genes. Um, so a lot of people are probably familiar with promoters. They act in tandem with promoters. And part of the problem with these enhancers and identifying them is that there's hundreds of thousands of enhancers. Um, but we've ha we have the, this evidence that the enhancer promoters interact through various other assays, such as 3C. And then we also have evidence from these nascent transcript uh, assays that enhancer RNAs are produced at these enhancers, and they have a very short uh, half-life, and they're in the low abundance. So that's so we don't usually pick them up in general RNA seq. <clears throat> This is just a quick infographic of what's happening here in the enhancer promoter looping. Um, over here on the right, you can see that we have the promoter and Paul 2 and then we have the mRNA coming off, and this is what everyone's probably very familiar with, um, and it's being produced. And this is what you pick up in RNA-seq. And then you also have transcription factors and cofactors, but what we're really interested in, or I am specifically, is this enhancer on the other side and the eRNAs coming off of that um, with the Paul two activity. And those are thought to pull in all these transcription factors and cofactors and, and all these various other things. So what do the reads actually look like since we're talking about bioinformatics here and what we're interested in? Um, so these are just a couple of the various assays. And this is, I have a recent paper that I thought was really good that kind of summarizes all of these, um, so you can say we have GrowCap, CSRNA-seq, NetCage, StripeSeq, ProSeq, um, all of these. But let's start here at the bottom with total RNA-seq. And as you can see, just to orient everyone, we have the known enhancer here in yellow. And then we have the reads over here on the left along the gene uh, that's known. And so in total RNA-seq here, you can see that we have a strong peak on the antisense here. And then you can see that we kind of go along and have some some reads coming from there. <clears throat> um, the main point here is that we don't pick up the known enhancer in total RNA-seq. There's just not enough reads and not enough mature RNAs happening. Um, 
Whereas something in GrowCap, for example, you can see that we really pick up the known enhancer and have a lot of signal coming from there. However, we don't pick up the entirety of the transcript in, in GrowCap, for example. But you can see we also pick up this, this opposite um, transcriptional start site that's going in the other direction from the gene body itself. And then there's other things like ProSeq, which actually are nascent transcript assays, where you can see we pick up a little bit of the known enhancer. We don't have such a pronounced peak, perhaps, but then we also pick up the entirety of the gene body and things that are being transcribed all the way along. And so, as I was just talking about, we have Nancy, we have two different kinds of assays that we're kind of supporting. We have nascent transcripts, and then we have transcriptional start sites. Um, and I think this image from the same paper does a great job of illustrating this as well. Um, part of the problem is there's like 13 plus assays for nascent transcript identification and transcriptional start sites. Um, and as I said before, minor changes in the sample processing could lead up to greater than 20% in the final results. Um, and that's what they, they found. And I was validated by that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the history. Um, so let's start down here at the bottom. You can see the promoter um, and the transcriptional start site here. The blue is the TSS assay like GrowCap that I was just talking about, whereas the nascent transcript assay would be ProSeq. Um, neither of these are, are generic RNA-seq either um, that you're thinking about. So you can see in the TSS assay, we get a very pronounced peak. And this is actually at the promoter sequence of the, um, like at the very beginning of the promoter, then we have a slight break and this is CPG Island here. And then you have the nascent transcript assay. And then that picks up the entirety of the gene body and the elongation of that. Um, so these are the two different types of assays that we're picking up. The interesting part then is that we're picking up enhancers as well based on those. And so we have a TSS assay and that's where we're picking up the initial uh, transcription start site. And then we can also pick up the entirety of this transcript um, and where Paul 2 is actually working along the entirety of it. And then over here, this is just kind of talking about the directionality of these and whether we're pulling them with a cap or not a cap. Um, and I highly recommend the paper if, if you're interested in that. So a quick history of the development. Version 1.0 was developed by uh, Anishio Tripodi and Margaret Gruseo and uh, was released April 16th in 2019. Uh, in, in parallel, in 2017, uh, the Tehun Kim Lab at UTD started working to reproduce uh, a paper that, we, that came out in 2018 in a second data set, and I was mostly responsible for that. Um, this is kind of where I got my start with bioinformatics and reproducible research because I struggled to build a reproducible pipeline and reproduce the results from that paper. Um, and that's where I kept getting into the 20% variance of these things can really make or break the transcript calling. Um, and I didn't understand that at the time, but now uh, after being validated, it feels great that um, it's so much different than some other assays that you might be able to, the bioinformatics pipeline doesn't affect it that much. Um, and so I started creating my own like CID, CD workflows and templates for SnakeMake in around January, 2020. And then as soon as we had a little lab hackathon introducing it to everybody, I found enough core the week before and started looking to move everything over to that um, because I was excited to work with others on that and uh, doing a lot of great work here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the pipeline. This is how far we've come. This was a snake make um, DAG because there wasn't a DAG of the V1 of the NF core pipeline, but this is what I had in 2018. Um, you can see the original presentation where I'm boring my lab with things like Docker and and uh, other things as well in that. Um, but you can see the majority of this is we're just handling Homer and um, alignment is pretty much all. And then maybe an intersection of histones and the uh, GM data as well and handling those two cell lines. Very rudimentary. And so the obligatory metro map um, that I finished last night, and then James already has some some feedback for me. Um, but I like to thank all, all those that have worked on that. That was a great template and really easy to get going with that. So let's start over here. Um, 
with the fast queue. And then we can pretty much zoom through everything here because we're really standing on the shoulder of giants here and using a lot from RNA seq, um, which is great because it's a much smaller use of pipeline and there's a lot less users, but we benefit from all those bug reports now with sub workflows and modules and all those other things. So we can really jump all the way to transcript identification. Um, we just make some, some genome maps up here is kind of the only unique thing to us from RNA seq and support a few different aligners. Um, so the first thing is we're grouping all the replicates up. Um, and basically that's anything that's a, a technical replicate that we want to group up to increase the signal and biological replicates. And so then we feed that into for GrowSeq over here, if they're specifically, because that's what I, I've been so interested in. Um, we feed that into Homer and GrowHMM op optionally, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then everything else that's a transcriptional start site and GrowSeq and, and others, we feed that into Pints as well. And then we go into bed tools and we can intersect the two of these with a filter and without a filter, and then basically only call regions that we're interested in and drop the regions that we're not. So like we can drop the regions that are gene bodies and promoters because we know that those aren't going to be um, uh, eRNAs or other interesting RNAs. And then we can also make sure that we keep only regions that we're interested in, such as like those with histone modifications that um, indicate eRNAs. Then we just do some quick quanti quantification, and then we move into, into multi-QC. So another little added benefit that we were interested in was supporting CHM13, um, which is a new reference genome that came out recently. Um, highly recommend y'all look into that as well if you're interested in that. I'll be adding this to the template soon. Um, but the main thing here in this in this infographic that they found is they were specifically looking at methylation data and how the new reference improved calls. And then you can see over here on the left is the number of max peaks. And then you can see the the blue is the um, the old reference. <clears throat> and then you can see the CHM13 reference are the additional calls that were made from using this reference. So these may not be much and may not be of interest in things that are well known and well um, understood, but very relevant for, for nascent uh, transcript calling. So we have support for that in our iGenomes config, and you can just use CHM13 and align to that. So let's talk a little bit about the transcript identification because that's kind of the the most interesting part of the um, pipeline and what makes it unique. So there's a couple different options, as I said. First, if you're doing GrowSeq, I have some great support for that. If anyone would like to support other assays or um, would like to see it supported, please open an issue. So first is GrowHMM, and this is what kind of sparked us getting into NextFlow and into bigger pipelines was difficulty rep reproducing this and running this on big enough machines um, to actually use it because it's an R package. And it was released in 2015 by Minho Che, Charles Danko, and Lee Krauss, actually just down the street at UT Southwestern. Um, as you can see by the graphic up here, GrayChimim greatly out outperforms Homer um, in just about all of these metrics. And Slut or Sicer is actually just a chip seek calling um, or an old chipseq peak calling algorithm. And it actually kind of outperformed Homer, which we thought was interesting um, looking at this graphic. Um, so the, there's a couple of drawbacks to Gray in though. It's very time consuming because it requires tuning. And then it's also quite memory hungry um, when you're running on a bunch of samples. Um, and then we also reached out to the authors and Charles Denko recommended that we use T units, which is an unpublished uh, R package that doesn't require tuning. Um, so stay tuned on that. But right now, GrayGMM works and it does perform very well. And so as you can see, this is calling the entirety of the transcript though, um, just to note up there on the left. Oops, I think I missed Homer. So I'll just talk a little bit about Homer then. Without it, it uses a little bit more naive of a um, peak calling method. It's just looking for the for the transcript and the difference in the peak in itself um, on those. It was released in 2010 um, out of the Glass Lab, and then now is maintained by Chris Brenner. Um, that was what we originally used in our paper. It works pretty well. 
Um, the problem is it was made in a land before Docker. So it kind of um, has a couple of problems with like the way that it wants to pull in the references for you. But I finally realized you can just pass a FASTA in. It's like one line in the documentation and that works amazing. So we just run that on everything because if you're going to run your HMM and wait a couple hours, 20 minutes with Homer, you might as well get some results on that as well. Um, so again, I missed the slide on that. Let's now jump into Pints identification. And this is a new um, assay that just came out in 2022 here. And it's very exciting. Um, so I just left this in up at the top in figure A. This is just also illustrating the difficulty in reproducing these. And this is on the exact same data sets. And you can see the difference in the Homer and the Great Jimim results and just how much they vary and just a slight tweak in a tool. You'd expect maybe better performance, but you wouldn't expect completely different results uh, based on what tool you're using. Um, and so down here at the bottom, this is the pints identification method. And just in a rudimentary way, it works very similarly to max two. And so there's just a, this is a potential true peak um, based on the density of this. And it's very easy to pick out. And then it, does some algorithms, picks up the local background noise from these, and these are all the light blue. And then you can see in the purple um, from those, that's then a potential peak that it needs to test and see, is that actually a peak or is it just more noise um, from the assay itself? And so what Pines is doing is really picking up these TSS start sites, as you can see from the read pile up here. It's just picking up the TSS site rather than the entirety of the transcript, which might actually lead out all the way along here. Um, so as I said, it was released in 2022. So it's a little more relevant than 2010 and 2015 um, from the UN List Lab. It determines the TSS start site is really what it's doing as opposed to the entire transcriptional unit um, because it's mainly focusing on TSS assays. Um, it also achieves kind of the optimum balance among, this is from their from their paper, uh, resolution, robustness, sensitivity, specificity, and computational resources required. Um, there's a couple of other tools that can also be used, such as DREG, but those require GPUs, and you start getting into all kinds of difficulty for users and uh, specific machinery. And it also supports 10 assays just out of the box and uh, works. So that's a that's a quick win. And then we can kind of support all of those through using Pints um, and just handling most of the upstream and downstream processing of those. So uh, Cunningham's law here, the best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question, it's to post the wrong answer. So if you think that any of this information isn't correct or we should be doing things differently, please open an issue or drop into Slack. Um, I know there's not a lot of cohesion on the nascent assay transcript identification, but I'd love to um, help the community build a kind of a group um, ideal workflow on this. And so with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. So I have now allowed everyone to unmute themselves. If there are any questions, um, you can, uh, yeah, Hashil? Oh, right. I'm in the shower. Yeah. I shouldn't be in the shower. <laughs> Let me remove the background um, or change it. There we go. Uh, hi, Edmund. Yeah, thanks. Great talk. I think for this pipeline in particular, um, as we're realizing now a lot on NF Core is that we've got the really nice pipelines, but we need to be able to validate the results uh, between releases and stuff. And this is kind of the things that have come up during the summit. And I think this is a really nice example of that, because as you mentioned, you know, you, you tweak some parameters or you run the pipeline in a different way and, you know, you get all of that variability in the results. And so it's really important to be able to reproduce the results. Um, have you thought about full size test data sets and how we can validate um, whether the results are actually optimal across releases? So say, for example, you or someone else comes to tweak the pipeline that we're not negatively impacting the results that you should be getting. Exactly. That is something that I've thought about. So I haven't gotten a AWS full test going for GrowSeq yet. 
I do have two tests that were in the pints um, that they set up or they created some test data examples that I asked for because they had they didn't have any examples of the actual usage of it. And so from those, we can then call the call the peaks um, on CoPro and the other ones. I'm missing the other one, but there's two test data sets already um, that are full data sets that I've ran. And then I have regression tests of those that I'm saving as well to compare against. And they actually have an entire element matrix. So I can we can probably pick a few of those and see if we can reproduce those each time, or at least benchmark where the nascent pipeline is and see make sure that we're not changing drastically on those. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um a second question. So no controls, right? You don't you don't have controls for GrowSeq. Um you do or the control sample is kind of included into that. And that they talk talk about in the Pites paper a little of some tools require you to have controls. Um the tools that we're using don't really require to the controls. Okay. So that, so then the background model is built up and then the, the core level will call the peaks based on some random distribution in the genome. Mm -hmm. Um, and last question, wh why not using Max and other conventional callers? Why, why is Homer? Homer seems seems quite primitive, I guess, in terms of peak calling and stuff. Um, why, why not something more sophisticated like Max? Is there more false positives? Is Legacy. Um, Homer, you yeah. can also tweak some of the important things of like it picks up on the, I'm so, I missed the, the image, but basically it picks up on the peak and then it picks up on the the trailing tail of it is actually the piece that's really important there instead of here, I'll just pull it up. This is what Homer's actually doing. Whereas in Max, you might just pick up the peak. You're actually picking up this downstream transcript is why Homer's unique to that. Okay. And Sicer, I presumably does something similar because it calls larger peaks as well, right? It's able to mm -hmm. yeah. call these sorts of notes. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. Uh, there's also another question in the chat. Why do you use feature counts and not other quantification methods as in RNA-seq? Um, feature counts is always just what I've used for that. I'm open to other ideas on it. It's not the exact same as RNA-seq and most of those are RNA-seq specific um, is part of the issue on the quantification of those. So the difference is, is we pass in the genes count with those. And then we also count with the identified transcripts and identified uh, transcriptional start sites of those and give you counts of all of those. So that's kind of the difference. And then downstream, you kind of have to do your own math behind the scenes and stats because um, it's not the exact same as RNA-seq in terms of like how the math works out on those. Yeah, so I Again, guess also not well-defined. You're counting with RNA-seq, you're counting um things that overlap, overlap spliced transcripts where there's gross seek you're looking at the entire gene body where splicing isn't important so feature counts kind of um can do that in this case whereas with rna seq as we've known and had previous discussions it's not ideal for the transcript splicing type quantification exactly exactly well said um it's just kind of it's simple or like it works it can work in a very simple way is the is the reason that we're using feature counts. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions. So with that, I want to thank you, of course, Edmund, but also the John Zagerberg Initiative for funding the Bite Size Talks. And as usual, uh, if there are any questions, you can always go to the NFCore works, uh, workspace on Slack and uh, the Nason channel and ask your questions there. Thank you very much.